Okay, we're going to look at test D as in delightful, um, parts 2, 3, and 4, so number 25 through 37, and see how we did. So they started us out with a pretty basic one on number 25. They're giving us a rectangle whose length and width are represented by polynomials, and they want us to find the area. So we're going to multiply our width times our length, whichever way you want to say it. Okay, doesn't matter the order because of the commutative property. So we're distributing, obviously going to end up with six terms here, because when you have two terms times three terms, okay, that'll give us one, two, three, four, five, six, combining like terms and writing our answer in standard form. So starting with the highest exponent down to your constant term. Okay, going on to number 26. Determine all the zeros of the function. So they gave us a quadratic function, and we know the zeros are the roots, or where this quadratic function crosses the x-axis. Okay, now they did take it, and that's a very interesting how they took it, and they had already factored, partially factored it for you. Okay, but here we end up with a dot that needs to be factored again. Notice that I have equals zero all the way down here because remember when solving a quadratic, okay, the whole premise is that to find the roots, your x values, it's when your y value is equal to zero. Okay, that's when you would have an x intercept. So as we go down here, Okay, setting the factors, each factor equal to zero, um, we end up with, <coughs> excuse me, the following root. And actually, just realized, kind of wasn't paying attention here, because I got down to the bottom, I'm like, okay, why do we have three roots? Well, because this is actually a cubic. We never did anything like this. This is actually a practice test that was created before the regents was given with what people presumed might be on the regents. Um, so I wouldn't foresee that they're going to give us something like this in a cubic, okay? Um, but because they did give us the first factor, we could go from there, and that's fine. Um, we know that a cubic is going to touch the um, x-axis in three different places, possibly. That's the most, and that's what happened here. So that's all fine. This could also be put into your graphing calculator. You could look at your table of values to confirm your answers are correct. You would look in your table of values and look for y values of 0, and you would find them when x was negative 3, negative 2, and positive 2. So that would be a way to check that. Okay, moving on to number 27, a systems of equations problem. Um, won't surprise me at all if we see something like this in the regions. It's a pretty basic problem. Um, a system of equations is when you have more than one equation um, and you have two variables. So you are going to have two let statements. Okay, there are two unknowns. And as you can see, one and two equations. Um, once you have your two equations, then you have to choose which method you are going to use to solve this. There are actually three methods. Uh, it could be solved graphically, okay, but that's not what they're... Oh, look at here, though. They did give us that option down here. Okay, that's fine. It could be solved graphically, and then there are two algebraic methods, the substitution method and the elimination method. You can see that I'm setting myself up here to use the substitution method. I moved m to the other side of the equation so that I have an s equals. I could have moved the s to the other side and had m is equal to 26 minus s. Either way, it doesn't matter. So now, in the original equation, wherever I see s, I can sub in 26 minus m. So that could go in right here. You may not have used the substitution method. That's what makes it tricky when checking your work to my work in a systems problem. Um, if you didn't do your, you know, if you didn't use the same method as I did, um, it's, it's trickier to check. So you may need to, if you didn't get this correct, you may need some help from me to figure out what happened. Um, the other method I could have used was elimination. And what I would have to do is multiply this entire, let's change colors, multiply this entire equation by a number that would cancel out either the S or the M values. So I could multiply like by negative 1.25. 
okay, all the way through all three terms, and then the S's would cancel. Then I could solve for M. Okay, once I know what M is, I can sub that in and get, find out what S is. So there are many um, different possibilities in this type of problem. This is very unique. I have never seen before where they give you the option to, to solve graphically and or algebraically. Um, and again, this was a test, a sample test that was made um, in anticipation of what our regions would look like. So again, this could happen, but I've never seen it. So anyway, um, going through me using my substitution method in place of S, I was subbing in the 26 minus M. And then be, having just one variable here, I'm able to solve and find out what M is. Now once I know what M is, I can sub it into one of my original equations. Okay? And actually I should not have done this because I could have made a mistake here. I really should have subbed this into S plus M equals 26. 15 plus, well, it should be S. I'm just going to, I was going to write it backwards, but don't want to mess anybody up. So S plus 15 equals 26. So S, of course, is still equal to 11, but we know we're never supposed to use the transformed equation. Okay? And then what do I have going on over here? I must have, oh, look, it wasn't that nice of me to do it all these different ways. Over here, I use the elimination method. Looks like, maybe not. What do I have there? M is 15, 11. Okay. So over here, I didn't use the elimination method. What I did was this is what I was, the work I was doing to be able to graph this. Oh my God, that would be awful. Okay, I took my equation and I transformed it into a y equals right here. And then I have my slope and my y intercept. Oh, that is just horrid. Okay, that is certainly not the way that I would proceed with this problem. So this problem was about songs and movies. So there were 11 songs and 15 movies. If you graphed it, this would be your point of intersection. You certainly could graph it on your graphing calculator. But again, oh, that just would not be cool. Okay. Let's go on to number 28. Solve the following 4x in terms of a and b. So this is what we call a literal equation where it's full of variables. Okay, and we are not going to get just a single numeric answer. We are going to get an answer full of variables. Now, we're going to solve it for x in terms of a and b. So that just means that x is going to be all by itself when you get down to the bottom. So in this case, what's interesting is the x is with a b here and with an a there. So what we're going to do is move the bx term to the other side so that both terms that contain x are on the same side. Now, both of these terms contain an x. That's their common factor. I need to pull that out. Okay, so I'm factoring out their x, their common factor, and then what I'm left with is a minus b equal to 15. Now, once I've pulled that x out so it's all by itself, now I can divide both sides by the um, expression a minus b, and that will leave x all by itself. Okay, the real trick there is knowing to factor out the x. Okay, number 29. So Terry solved this equation using the quadratic formula, and he stated that there are no real solutions. So that means that there must be some imaginary solutions to this, and that only happens when you end up with a negative inside of your apt, um, square root symbol. Okay, that is not possible in what we're going to learn. I believe it's 11th grade where they will talk to you about um, you'll be working with imaginary roots when you're taking the square root of a negative number. So we've got all the way down there and Terry was correct. Okay, so to justify my answer, showing the work, showing that that is what happened, answering the question, yes, Terry is correct because you can't take the square root of a negative number, it's not possible. Well, it is possible. I shouldn't say it's not possible. I really should say you can't take the square root of a negative number and get real roots. Because you can do it, but you're going to get imaginary roots. Okay, so we're going to change that. OK. 
okay? And don't forget the quadratic formula is given to you on your reference sheet at the Regents exam. Okay, going on to number 30. So here we have a problem where we're starting with an initial number of bacteria and then it is going to be doubling. You can see all the keywords that I've underlined here. Um, so we have exponential growth going on here. So what we're going to use is our formula y equals a times b to the x power, where a is our initial amount and b, our base, tells us what is occurring in the problem. Is it doubling? Is it tripling? Is it quadrupling? Is it a half-life, which would be 0.5? Okay, so the base here, the 2, is our rate of growth in this case. Okay, so just subbing those values into here, this is what we end up with. They only want the function rule that can be used to determine this. Now notice they're using B of T and T. Okay, so notice that's what I used when I subbed in. You want to make sure, remember, the details are really important. You want to be looking for those things. You really have to scrutinize every problem. Okay, and then they want you to use that function rule to see how many bacteria she can expect after 10 hours. So now I'm finding B of 10. I'm substituting in 10 in place of T. You put this into your calculator exactly how it is, and there you go. You get your final answer. Okay, going on to number 31, this is one of those story graphs, which, which we did not too long ago, and it shows Sarah's bike ride, okay, and it asks us to state the domain and the range, so that's pretty easy. We know the domain are the x values, the range are the y values, so looking on our x-axis, she starts at zero and she ends at nine hours. And we include both of those, okay, because she started there and actually ended there. We've got a closed circle up there. So notice I wrote a compound inequality, which describes an interval of numbers. So starting at zero all the way to nine with our variable x in the middle. When you write this way, the only symbols you're going to use are less than or less than or equal to, and you have to decide which it is. We wanted to include zero, and we wanted to include nine. Okay, looking at the range. The range is the distance in miles. Starts at zero and goes up here to 60. So a very similar situation here, starting at zero, going to 60, but remember we need a Y in the middle for the range. Okay, then they want to know the interval of time during which Sarah was riding the fastest and explain how you know. So I gave the interval between three and four hours. So let's see, picking between three and four hours. Now notice in my um, inequality that I wrote, okay, so three less than x less than four. I didn't include three and four, because remember this is where she's starting. This is where she's ending. It's like climbing stairs. When you start, you're not increasing or decreasing in the same as when you get to the top, okay? So in between three and four, and that's because it's very apparent that it is the steepest and it has the um, highest rate of change, and you would just have to write a quick sentence about that. Okay, 32. Use a method of completing the square to re rewrite the function in vertex form. Okay, so you're, this is cool. I can't believe, I don't think they'd give us this in the regions, honestly. Okay, but it's cool that they did here. Okay, so completing the square, starting out here, we know that if we're going to do this in vertex form, we leave our f of x or our y right in there. Okay, and what we're going to do is we're going to move our constant to the other side, so we get it over here, and we add our box on both sides. Now to fill in the box, we take our b value, which was 5, and we divide it by 2 to get 2.5, and we square it to get 6.25. Okay, so we can combine these two to get 8 and a quarter. And then over here, what we need to do is we need to factor this, okay? It factors to be x plus 2.5 squared. 
the x from here plus signs are the same okay whatever it is this came from right here b divided by 2 okay gives us a 2.5 now we're not going to we're not going to take the square root of both sides because we are writing this in vertex form. Okay, so we don't want to take the square root and get rid of this squared here. We need that there. We need to be able to put this into our graphing calculator and graph a quadratic. Okay, so we get to this point, we move the constant back to the other side, and here we go. There is our function rule in vertex form. And we know that right here is our h value, this is our k value, but don't forget that this is going to be the opposite when you have to write it as the vertex. So when you go down, you can see here is your vertex. And you could, to be sure, you could put this into your graphing calculator. You could go to your table of values. If you're unsure about whether this is a 2.5 or a negative, negative 2.5, look at that table of values and confirm it's correct. You need to take the time to do these things to ensure that all these little details are correct because it's those little details that are going to chip away at your score point after point. Okay, there you go. We've got an announcement again. Okay, so going on here, number 33. On this set of axes, solve the following systems of inequalities graphically. Okay, there's a lot of work here, a lot of details again, okay? Getting both of these into y equals, okay, the first one's okay. You've got your slope and your y-intercept. That's our method of graphing that we have to show, okay? Also, for greater than, you're going to have a dotted line shaded above. Now, we had to transform this one, okay? And be careful because sometimes when you transform, What's going to trick you is if you're dividing by a negative, you would have to change this sign. Okay, they didn't do that in this one, so that's cool. Okay, so we're going to divide by 2. We end up with a slope of a half and a y-intercept of negative 3. So this is going to be a solid line due to the equal to, and we're going to shade below. Okay, so you go through and you... Let me move this up so you can see it all. Okay. In this case, we had to establish a scale of 10 all the way around. You graph your lines as you normally would. That's a very simple task of your slope and your y-intercept. Okay. And then you just need to make sure that you have a solid and a dotted line. Okay. In this case, we shaded above. Here, we shaded below. Where they overlap is where you put your S for your solution. Okay. And then you label in the other parts. Okay. Larry believes 4, negative 1 is a solution. Is he correct? Explain your reasoning. Make sure you read all of that, okay, so you get to the part about explaining. 4, negative 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, negative 1 is right there. No, Larry's not correct because that point does not satisfy both inequalities because it, because it is on the line and not in the solution set. Now, this is a deal. It actually satisfies the red line here because it's solid, but the dotted line means not included, so it doesn't satisfy that one. Okay, so we're looking for a point in the solution set that works for both of them. Okay, number 34. Um, this type of problem, like, I guess we could see something like this. We do have the formulas on our formula reference sheet given to us. Um, it's just a simple volume problem. They have given you um, the height of the tank, the width, and the length. Okay, we had to come up with this right here, the L plus 6 I used, and this was unknown. And then just multiplying those together, you end up, the whole purpose of them starting you this way, you end up with a quadratic equation. Something to the second degree is their purpose. And then you can solve for that. Now, they want it in simplest radical form, which means being a quadratic, simplest radical form could be solved by completing the square or using the quadratic formula, whichever you prefer. So you're getting your A, B, and C values. You don't get those, though, until this is in standard form. This is always step number one. You must put it in standard form equal to zero. Then you proceed from there, no matter what method you're using. 
So you can go down through and check it out. Um, when we get down to the bottom here, I end up rejecting one because we are looking for the length, so that cannot be a negative. And this right here represents the length of the tank. Okay? And they don't ask us to put it in decimal form, just simplest radical form. If you use completing the square and you have an error, come see me and I can help you with that. Okay, number 35, find the first five terms of the recursive sequence. Okay, the key to doing these is writing this out just like we did in class. Okay, if you have an n and an n minus 1, that means the n minus 1 is previous to the n. So to get the next term, it's 2 times the previous plus, now this is different, 3 times n. We didn't do anything like that, but we can do this. Our starting value, f of 1, is negative 2. And they want the first five terms. Holy cow. Now, in this, you know in class when they said, they, they would say the uh, first five and we would get five more. I notice on this one, this answer key must have included that one as the first. That's the first time I've seen that. I agree with this more than I do the way that we did it in class. I don't think that wording made sense, but I was going based on what I had seen on all the exams. Now keep in mind again, this exam is not an official regents. This was a practice that was made. So if somebody else made this, and that must be the way they do it, but I was following the way the regents did it. Okay, so if you already know f of 1, you're the next one you're finding is f of 2. So to get f of 2, it's 2 times the previous, which is f of 1, plus 3 times the n value. n is your term number. Okay? So this is your n value. So that's what you're going to use here. You do the math, okay, and you end up with f of 2 equals 2. Doing the math is the easy part. The harder part is understanding how to get to that first line. So then to get the next one, f of 3, it's 2 times the previous one, which is f of 2, plus 3 times n. Well, in this one, n equals 3 because you're looking for the third term, and so on. You can follow it all the way through. They want to know, is this sequence arithmetic, geometric, or neither? Well, recursive is neither because there is no common ratio your R value or common difference, your D value. Okay, let's go on to 36. So, this one's a little bit tricky. Tom lives in a town 360 miles directly north of New York City, and on a Saturday he takes the tram, train, I can't see that, from his town to the city. Okay, and they want us to write an equation to represent the distance Tom is from New York City after X hours. Okay, well, my y-intercept, 360, is where he's beginning. He's beginning 360 miles away from New York City. If you notice up here, what I did is I came up with two ordered pairs that I could use to find the slope of this line. So he starts when he begins, beginning time is zero, he's at 360 miles away. Then they tell me that after two and a half hours, he's 210 miles away. So now I have another data point that I can use, okay? So you'll see right here where I use those data points to find my slope of this function rule, and the slope is negative 60. So now I'm able to come up with this equation, function rule, d of x, the details again, okay, is equal to negative 60x plus 360. Okay, because this is representing the distance Tom is from New York City. So keep in mind, this is where he begins, but every hour he's 60 miles closer. So that's why this is a negative um, rate of change. Okay, then what I did was I plugged this into the graphing calculator, this function rule, and I was able to come up with this table of values that I could then use to set up my graph. Okay, now notice that my graph has a title and labels, of course. You don't want to lose points for that. Okay, I graphed my points. It's only in the first quadrant, which makes sense. We wouldn't have any negative time or negative distance. And you can see starting here at zero hours at 360 miles away. And after six hours, Tom finally makes it to New York City.
Okay, using either your equation or your graph. So they gave you the option. Determine how many hours it takes the train to get to New York City. So on the graph, we just talked about that, if you use that route. If you did it algebraically using your equation, okay, what I did here was I plugged in zero for my y value, which is how far am I from New York City. Well, when I get there, I'm zero miles from New York City. And then I could solve algebraically. Okay, our last one, the big six-pointer. And this one was definitely <laughs> a lot of work. Okay, they gave you a quadratic function and they needed you to graph it. Um, it has something to do with science project and a rocket, which is not uncommon for this type of function rule. You're going to put that function rule right into your graphing calculator so that you can generate this table of values. Okay, notice again, I have for my graph, I have a title, I have labels. No surprise, time is on the x-axis height is on the y-axis, okay? I was able to come up with these data points, okay, that I could put on the graph, and then down here, okay, how did I figure out what this was going to be? Well, I needed to know when it hit the ground, when the rocket hits the ground, it is when your y-value or your height is equal to zero, okay? This is where it began, Okay, this is where it ends. So let's go over down below and see what they had us doing here. Determine the maximum height. Okay, so the maximum height is your vertex. So the height is our y value of our vertex. So what you're going to do is take your axis of symmetry. This is your formula that you have to have memorized. That will not be on the reference sheet subbing in your B value and two times your A value. Okay, where did the A, B, and C values come from? When you go up here, A, B, and C. Okay, that's where you get those from. So subbing those in, you end up with an X value of 2.25. Okay, so at 2.25 seconds, then you have to sub that into your function rule to evaluate it to find out what is your height at that time. So at 2.25 seconds, your height is 88 feet. So you had to do this to get the final answer of what they really wanted, which was 88 feet. And you can see up in the graph, I have identified that vertex point right up here at the top. Okay, the last part, state how long, so time. It takes the rocket to hit the ground to the nearest tenth of a second. This is how we're going to find this value right here. Label the point on your graph that represents when this occurs. Again, if you don't read all of this and you don't label that point like I did, so all I had to do was label that, you're going to lose a full point out of your six points, okay? Because there's no partial credit. So what I need to do when they say nearest tenth of a second, I know that this is not going to work out nicely and that I am going to have to use either completing the square or quadratic formula because this is a quadratic function. Okay, so I s first number one, you must first set your function rule equal to zero. Then identify your A, B, and C values. And then I subbed in to the quadratic formula. And you can follow all this. Wow, this was a lot of work, but this is what six-point questions are like. I get to the end, I get an X value that's negative. Well, we know that our time can't be negative, so this is rejected. When you reject, through here, okay? Reject, you must write the word. Okay, if you're going to put, I know a lot of you do this, you just, you forget to write reject possibly, and then you go through here and it looks like not equal. That you're not going to get credit for that as being something that's rejected, so please don't do that. Okay, so then down here, you can see it's kind of scrunched in, but you end up with 4.595 dot dot dot. So to the nearest tenth, as they asked for right here, that would be 4.6. Then I had to go up and label the point. So that was a wing dinger, okay? But that's what it's going to be for six points. Okay.